So I built my solar yacht prototype almost entirely alone, by hand, and then sailed away from Finland and somehow got trapped in the frozen canals of France. This video is about how that happened. Not as an excuse and not as a drama, but as a clear breakdown of what I misunderstood, what I over-optimized and what I've now corrected. I built the Helios 11 in Finland, almost alone, with the help of my brother. I left late, very late. Not because I didn't know winter was coming, but because I underestimated how much time and energy the build would actually take. I thought a simple shed and simple tools would keep costs low and speed things up. That assumption was wrong. From a development perspective, inadequate tooling directly impacts hull accuracy, surface finish and system integration speed. In composition constructions especially, build environment quality has a disproportionate effect on final performance. For a relatively small additional investment, I could have saved weeks of work and massive amounts of energy. I'm talking about a warm, dry, 12 by 4 meter hull, proper flat clamps for plywood seams, a few specialized grinding tools, better epoxy and paint handling systems that don't run out mid-process, a lifting and turning device, a proper pressure spray system for painting, and realistically, one more person helping during the most critical phases. Furthermore, limiting manual work to around 8 hours a day, except during moments that cannot be split, would have increased total output instead of reducing it. The second realization was harder. With almost the same cost and nearly the same amount of work, Helios 11 could have been significantly more efficient. The most obvious change would have been lightly adjustable solar panels. Simple mechanisms, nothing complex, just enough adjustability to optimize winter angles and take advantage of bifacial output. Then, two additional 4.8 kWh Pylontech batteries would have dramatically improved winter reliability. No extra space would have been needed, as the interior layout already supports up to six batteries with full access. Then we have hull geometry. Reducing the waterline width by roughly 25 cm could have increased immersion depth while reducing windage and wave interaction, less wave slap underway, less movement at anchor and lower resistance at cruise. This is maybe my biggest regret, because I can't change it anymore. But the next one, I can and I will. It's a reverse bow with a small bulb. It will increase the efficiency of the hull disproportionately to the amount of work that is required. Simply, I'm gonna build this reverse bow and bulb combination out of foam and glass fiber. This means only one extra day of work. That alone would have effectively extended the waterline by over a meter. From a hydrodynamic standpoint, increasing effective waterline length raises the theoretical hull speed while simultaneously reducing wave-making resistance at displacement speeds. This translates directly into higher average cruise speeds and lower energy consumptions per nautical mile. Another decision that seemed rational at that time, but wasn't, was how aggressively I optimized for lightness. I assumed that if the hull was rigid enough, waves and wind wouldn't matter much. The boat is light, efficient and self-writing according to geometry and center of mass, so I thought I would simply ride through the conditions. That is partially true, 
but not comfortable and not optimal. Most resistance, slamming and discomfort actually happens only near the surface layer. A hole that skips over waves or rolls excessively is often less efficient than one that sits deep in more stable water. So the new design question became very simple. How do you sink the hole deeper while keeping the total displacement low? That leads toward ultra-narrow monohulls with extremely low centers of gravity or ultra-narrow catamarans that move more like trains than boats, ignoring medium waves and chop, remaining light and requiring minimal power to cruise. That's how you really get racing level performance with relatively modest power inputs. Above 20 knots on around 40 kilowatts becomes realistic when the geometry is right. Making Helios 11 ultralight was not optimal even for calm conditions. Fortunately, the hull itself was overbuilt. That means I can now add functional mass. Batteries, solar, navigation systems, autopilot, water makers, heating, even recovery systems such as infrared saunas are possible. Previously, I optimized standard boat building logic. Now I'm optimizing specifically for solar yachts that must perform across seasons and conditions. At this point, I want to briefly step out of the analysis and explain why I've documented all of this so carefully. I've put thousands of hours and most of my savings into getting to this point. Not to build something impressive, but to understand what actually makes a solar liveaboard work in performance, in comfort, and in real daily use. Over time, the patterns became very clear. What matters, what doesn't, what looks good on paper, but fails in reality, and what small decisions compound into either freedom or friction. That is why I distilled this experience into a short book that goes into the fundamentals of efficient solar yachts and how they can be built or commissioned on a realistic, affordable budget. It's not the blueprint and it's not the sales pitch for a specific design, it's a decision-making framework. If you've ever thought about one day having your own solar liveaboard, this will save you a lot of time, money and false assumptions. The link is in the descriptions. And if you choose to get it, you're also directly supporting the research and development of the next generation of these boats. Alright, back to the systems. Early on, I also tried too hard to prove solar. I didn't even install a charger. That was a big mistake. A mid-speed charger that restores roughly 50% of battery capacity overnight costs very little, weighs almost nothing and dramatically increases operational flexibility. I basically got this system for $150 and it's been very useful. From a systems perspective, grid charging isn't a failure of solar design. It's an efficiency multiplier when you're in low light conditions, such as the Nordic winter. We find ourselves in very unoptimal environments and that brings me to the auxiliary propulsion. At the measured resistance levels of Helios 11, even a small 10 horsepower engine would allow extremely long range at modest speeds simply because the hull is so efficient. With a single large tank, we could cruise over 500 nautical miles at 8 knots easily. Solar or petrol, the hull doesn't care. It is simply efficient and works with any propulsion system. However, I avoided combustion engines because of the noise, complexity and their limited usefulness during summer when solar output is abundant. Still, they add safety and range. That role is currently handled by the backup sail of the Helios 11, but a hybrid configuration still remains viable. 
Another factor I underestimated was external operations. Canal systems don't always operate smoothly, especially if you don't plan around it. Lock closures during holidays delayed my progress, and those days compounded. My Christmas holiday in Belgium, Liège, was the last drop that caused me to get stuck in the frozen canals of France. On the other hand, some systems worked flawlessly. Food and water logistics were never an issue. High efficiency refrigeration combined with cold ambient temperatures allowed continuous stocking of healthy food with minimal energy input. I've always had a healthy supply of fresh meat, fruit, dried fruit, cheese, mineral water, berries, and so on. Another technical oversight was the steering mechanism. The motor requires an integrated fin. My temporary bolt-on fin works, but an integrated solution will improve tracking, reduce steering corrections, and also lower the overall resistance that the boat makes. This efficiency and directional stability gain would directly translate into range. A small change, but huge gain. Heating and insulation were also underestimated. I assumed I'd reach warmer climates quickly, so I relied on clothing and willpower. Just a bit of insulation and efficient heating, still keeping it lightweight, can really lift up the cabin temperature when you're in a marina or when you're at anchor, when you have sufficient solar energy, even in winter. In this way, excessive energy is turned into recovery, warmth, comfort and rest. Now all of these lessons I've learned feed directly into the next designs. Helios 11 continues to evolve and parallel development of larger platforms such as the Halo 13 are already underway. My recent computer simulations combined with physical scale testing in real waves show that we're really moving in the right directions. All of these lessons I will apply to the next catamaran version that will start behaving more like a super yacht in a small scale, both in performance and comfort. And of course, before that, we will optimize the Helios 11 first. In hindsight, over-optimizing simplicity and lightness made the journey less simple. Those lessons are now locked in, they're being applied to build the most efficient living solutions that also allow you to travel the world freely, however you want, whenever you want to. This is the real freedom I'm talking about and that's why I started this journey in the first place. I hope you learned a lot from this video, stay tuned to the mission by subscribing. And as always, don't forget to get out there.